Hello, I'm Yongbei. I'm the manager of Korean audio file community Muon and maintainer of Hi-Fi Immersion YouTube channel. I'm here at Royco in Seoul, Korea today, and we have Mr. Dan D'Agostino, the founder and chief engineer of Dan D'Agostino Master Audio Systems. Thank you. Hello, Dan. It's Hello. an honor and pleasure to finally meet you. Oh, here. thank you. <laughs> It's uh, nice to be here in Korea again. It's very, very, I enjoy yeah. being here. Mm -hmm. Well, the weather today is not that nice, right? <laughs> well, you know, I come from Arizona, so we have lots of sunshine. Right. 340 days a year. Right. So, little rain, yeah. wind's kind of nice. Well, it's, it's a lot like upstate New York, in a way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you're from uh, Buffalo? Niagara uh, Falls, York, Buffalo right. area, yeah. Right. Um, so. Uh, how did you start out with uh, your uh, audio business? Well, I, um, I've always been kind of an audiophile since I was 11 or 12 years old. My father was kind of an audiophile. Right. You know, he built some clip horns out of a kit mm -hmm. and uh, bought a uh, Lafayette radio receiver with tubes integrated. Right. Had a, um, uh, I think it was a Gerard turntable and uh -huh. played music and I really loved listening to the music and a big system like that at the time. It was, yes. it was a lot of fun and I really kind of carried that interest and later on um, worked a little bit at an audio store when I was 15, right. sweeping the floors for them, uh -huh. dusting the Macintosh tubes off and uh, it was really uh, a lot of fun uh, to, to learn there. Uh, the, the man who ran the store was very nice and taught me a lot about audio and sound and it was so it was good good learning but I've always kind of been an audiophile and mm -hmm. and when I um, uh, later on went to college I um, I have an engineering degree but I always really liked audio did you go to SUNY Buffalo or? no 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 I went to uh, University of California oh California. really yeah wow yeah so uh, we're in uh, University of California then yeah, uh, and they, well, there there are there are a lot of different campuses. Well, at Berkeley. At uh, Berkeley. Yeah. Well, you're you're one of the smart ones. <laughs> oh, it was in the '60s, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I had a good time at school and uh -huh. learned a lot. Uh huh. So, uh, from Bar Berkeley, you went back to uh, Buffalo. I did. Uh, my dad lived there. Um, uh, I, I went to school through the Navy because uh -huh. I was in the service. Okay. And. Um, uh, then when I got out, I, uh, my father needed my help at his mm -hmm. business, so I went back to help him. Mm -hmm. and what then, did your father do? He was a, a tool and die maker at uh, Bell Aerospace oh, okay. and worked on the lunar lander. Yeah. And he, um, he then had also had a, uh, when he retired from that, he opened an appliance business where he serviced uh, appliances, wash machines and dryers and had a big business selling them. Okay. And, um, and a bunch of trucks on the road, and he, uh, he did that, but that certainly wasn't a place where I could go. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, I started working, and I, I worked at an audio store for a while, right. and then uh, started deciding that I could be a designer, you know, for audio equipment, because uh, that was really my passion. Wow. So I, uh, I started looking at the stuff that, that was around, and high-end audio was at its... Uh, first it's it's infancy mm -hmm. so I start looking at some of those things and I learned a lot going through those things in the 70s and okay. playing around with stuff and finally had this idea that what the world needed was a hundred watt pure class A amplifier right. before then you you went you were in Canada right I worked for a, a speaker company right. called Dayton Wright mm -hmm. and I worked for uh, Mike Wright yeah. and uh, we you know, we uh, I learned a lot about electrostatic speakers and right. stuff like that. So it's hard to control in a way, yeah. right? Yeah, we had a we had a lot of I had a lot of fun learning. I have a lot of different disciplines that I that I I, I work in, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that um, working for other companies, I learned a lot about what I didn't want to do, yes. and certainly knew what I wanted to do. Right. It's not easy to you know uh, to know what what path you're going to go. No, at, at, at that age. No. So, who was your greatest teacher at at 
in your youth? I think I have to go back to my high school. Uh -huh. My um, uh, electric shop teacher yeah. in early high school, right. he was an, also an audiophile and a frustrated engineer. Uh -huh. And uh, I, would, I brought him a book called Wireless World. I think I was in eighth grade and I showed it to him and he, he started telling me about how vacuum tube amplifiers work uh -huh. and, and they, there was an article about a Williamson push-pull amplifier uh -huh. and he helped me. He said, we can buy the components and build one. Yes. So I, I went and got the components because components were all over the place then right. for building tube amps. Right. So we were able to build one and, and uh, that was a thrill. Uh -huh. That was a thrill. But um, I learned that tubes were, were pretty cool because you can, you can do a lot of things with tubes and they still work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, Berkeley, you studied in electrical engineering. Electrical engineering, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, after, after Canada, you went to New York, right? Yeah. Lived in New York for a while. Mm -hmm. And then um, at, um, I think in 78, mm -hmm. I had this idea for this pure class A amplifier yes. and um, I uh, built it pretty much in my uh, my kitchen and I went to see an audio reviewer with it a guy named Peter Axel mm -hmm. the audio critic yes and I brought a um, like a 80 watt version of it because I couldn't I couldn't cool a hundred watt version because okay. I couldn't find any heat sinks right. that were readily available uh -huh. so I built it I got about 80 watts out of it in pure class A, mm -hmm. and I brought it there and had him listen to it, and just to give him an idea of what he thought. He thought it was awesome, mm -hmm. you know. So I uh, I decided to make it a product. Yes. And then um, when I finally did all the final designs, I uh, I went up to Connecticut because uh -huh. too expensive to make anything in New York, in New York right. and found a very inexpensive place uh -huh. in um, in Bridgeport. Right. And. Uh, in fact, it was like $170 a month oh. with heat mm -hmm. and uh, uh, electricity. Yes. It would be great to have them these uh -huh. days. Yeah. But anyhow, mm -hmm. I, built, uh, I built three of those amplifiers, mm -hmm. and I brought them to the 1980 CES show in Las Vegas. Right. I drove them there. Mm -hmm. And um, people would listen, and they liked them. They, uh, they liked the idea of 100-watt pure class A because the only other pure class A amplifier in the market was a Mark Levinson ML2 yeah. and it was 25 watts. Right. This was a much, much uh, more powerful, robust mm -hmm. amplifier that could drive all sorts of speakers. All right. Everybody liked it. We got it. I got lots of orders. Uh -huh. uh, and when I got back to Connecticut, I put a production line together, which was really hard because I never really put a production line together. I can build one, two, or three exactly. of anything, but building 15 or 20, uh -huh. yeah, that was, that was a challenge. Yeah. So we start doing that, and uh, we, got, we, we continued to grow. We start growing from the minute we showed those amplifiers and just kept on getting bigger and bigger. Wasn't it difficult for you, uh, because you're a newcomer, right. uh, a lot of stores, uh, one carry your products, right? That's right. They wouldn't carry us because we were new. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I went to, see, audio was, was so big in the 80s, uh -huh. early 80s, right. uh, that each city you went into had four or five stores. Mm -hmm. So I would uh, take my amplifiers and drive along the East Coast, mm -hmm. stop at a city, yeah. and I would go to the, what, I, what I perceived to be the best dealer, uh -huh. and we'd do a demo, and if he liked it, he would either take it or say he wanted to wait, mm -hmm. and then I would go find another dealer in the city wow. until I got the dealer. Uh -huh. So every dealer I went, every city I went to, I got a dealer, I got paid, yeah. and then I went back yeah. and did so it again. How far south did you go? All the way to Florida. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> but I, it, it took me probably six trips to get to Florida. Mm -hmm. So I, my first, the, er, the, the closest yes. cities I did first, and then as I work my way south All right yeah so, so it was it was not easy it was it was uh, labor love and I liked doing it uh -huh. and I had a really uh, 
great dem demonstrable product. And you put it on products and speakers and you played them, you could hear how good the amplifier was. Such kind of amplifier didn't exist at that's the time, right. right? That's right. So it's one of the uh, strengths for your products. Yes. Say. That's yeah. the uh, KSA 100, right? Yeah. And then we made the KSA 50, uh -huh. which was really strange because when I released the KSA 50, mm -hmm. um, I figured that, you know, some people would want to buy that and because it was less money and smaller. Yes. But it was like it was like a really strange phenomenon that happened. Um, I got picked up in London at my distributor, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the reviewers reviewed the amplifier and right. loved it, and it just like it went. Long, you know, and nowadays we call it viral. It went viral. Right. People started buying the KSA oh, fifty. Ricardo. Yeah, Ricardo yeah. and uh, Absolute Sound. Yes. And people started buying it and buying it and buying it, mm -hmm. and was like crazy. Mm -hmm. But in the '90s, yeah. uh, if you looked at the demographics of that amplifier, that turned out to be the most copied amplifier right. that was ever in the in the in the history of audio. Mm -hmm. The KSA 50. Oh uh, yeah. So uh, in you know amplifier industry, um, uh, are there any good friends of yours? Well, Nelson Pass is a good friend of yeah. mine. Uh, he, yeah, he mentioned you. Yeah. yeah he's interviewing the past. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, how, how do you two get along? Oh, we get along great. Mm -hmm. We never had an issue getting along. Yeah. He's in California and you're in Arizona. Yep. Right? I understand. Uh, you, you worked with Ira Gale? Yes, I did. Yeah. yeah. What did you do? Well, um, first thing he wanted me to do, uh, I guess he had hired some engineers to work on an amplifier for mm -hmm. him, and it never got finished. Yes. So he gave me the amplifier, and he said, can you finish it? Uh -huh. I said, no, but I can design a different one. Uh -huh. So I did, wow. and I made it for him and brought it up to the UK, yeah. and uh, he didn't want to sell it. He uh -huh. just wanted to give it to his friend. Uh -huh. so when was that? Had to be has to be 74, 75, oh, really? something like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So before Krell. Then, yeah. Yeah. All right. And you had Krell Digital, which we made Krell Digital in uh, 1990, or I think it was 91 or 92. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, basically, you, you not only produced uh, amplifiers, but you also produced uh, DACs. We produced right? DACs and preamps and, and CD, and CD, CD players. players. Yeah. 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 We made some really, uh, I think we made some really great CD players. Uh -huh. And our uh, 64 times over sampling processor right. was quite extraordinary at the time. Yeah, gets really hot as well, right? Yeah, and not the, 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 the uh, DSPs got pretty warm. Uh-huh, yeah. 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 Then 2008 happened. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, then the Xeno um, Master audio system was made Afterward, right? Right. Um, I was uh, fired out of my own company by a minority investor that right. had that had uh, rights to do that, uh -huh. and he did that right after about a month after he bought, he did that yeah. investment. They thought they could run the company without me, so they uh -huh. they made an attempt. Okay. But um, at that point, I just uh, decided, after a lot of lawsuits, I uh, decided to uh, start. Dan D'Agostino. It's not easy to change it. Well, I mean, uh, start a new business at the time, uh, wasn't it? I mean, um, well, you have to first of all put yourself in my place. Right. The business that I had for thirty years, and it was my business. Right. And 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 my partner Rondi's business, uh -huh. we um, we were thrown out of our own business that right. we started. Right. Uh, didn't you get really upset? I did. Yeah. So I how did. did you cope with it? It was really hard to cope with, yeah. to tell you the truth. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, your 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 anger is over the top. Right. And you try to think rationally, but it's really difficult. Right. Uh, so I I couldn't think of anything to do mm -hmm. after I'd spent all my money legally. Right. And you know, lawyers are kind of funny. You know, they all say, "Oh, he can't do that." Blah blah blah. You know, we we can get this overturned right away, and none of that ever came true. Mm -hmm. 
we may have, and maybe I had the wrong lawyers, but I spent a lot of money, I mean, yes. really close to a million dollars wow. on lawsuits. Uh -huh. So then I said, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. So I just, I just had to figure out, you know, I love working in audio and I had right. some ideas that I wanted to do and, and I decided to, uh, to make the momentum amplifier. When you were at Krell, uh, the purpose of innovation was technological breakthrough, wasn't it? Yep. Yeah, but, uh, but at Dan D'Agostino, the purpose of innovation is for better sound. Uh, so what has caused uh, such a drastic change? I have to say that when I, when I was cut loose and I didn't have anything to do, I went around to a lot of different stores. Right. And I listened to what they had to say. Right. What did you think of this? What's your, what's your favorite system? What's your favorite sound? Uh -huh. And I listened to a lot of things and I realized that some of the stuff that I made at Krell was, was technologically more advanced than anything out on the market. Mm -hmm. But it didn't sound as good as some, uh, some other things. Right. What other amplifiers did you compare with? I don't remember uh -huh. most of the names. Yes. But I listened to a system. Oh, yeah. My stuff wasn't in oh, it. Okay. And uh, they said this. And I, and I enjoyed some of them a lot. Right. But I realized that. And I had a lo every piece of Krell gear that we'd ever made at my house. Uh -huh. Right. So I, uh, I start listening to it uh, more, more critically. I mean, we, we, were, we were, you know, always changing and, and working towards doing something technologically that no one had ever done before. Right. And we did a lot of those products. Right. Not always for the better sonically, mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the idea of making something but technically. But you always amazing. progressed. Yeah, we yeah. moved forward. Right. When I started this company, they said, why am I in this business? When did I enjoy this business? I enjoyed this business when I made the KSA 100 uh -huh. and the KSA 50. 50. Yeah. yeah, the rest of it was just building a company. Uh -huh. And then once I, I, I realized uh -huh. that the reason why I loved building those original products is uh -huh. because they sounded so good uh -huh. and there wasn't anything on the market that sounded like that. Right. Plus, they had, they had such a... a, a, a output stage that because they were running in class A uh -huh. and because they could produce so much current, they could drive any speaker that most amplifiers would not even, couldn't even possibly right. drive. Right. And Electrostatic speakers at that time. Electrostatics and yeah. ribbon speakers. Yeah. And, uh, it didn't matter which right. ones they drove. Right. And of course, you know, having worked at Dayton Wright, which was one of the most difficult speakers right. to drive, right. it would, it would drive, drive them without any problem at all. Exactly. And I had a pair. So yeah. I use them to uh -huh. play with, you know. Yeah. But um, when I did Dan D'Agostino, I just put, I, I did something that I'd never done before. My wife, Petra, worked for the Rob Report. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, I always was friends with the people at Rob Report, the guy who owned the magazine, Bill Curtis. Mm -hmm. And he and I were always talking. And he was always trying, because he was a friend of mine, to give me a hand. So I can get you into all these different places, yes. you know, and you can, you can show your stuff. But, you know, and, and I told him, I said, you know, Bill, we go to the, the shows and your demos and we, we fly around and we set our stuff up. You know, I get a space with him when he, when he did a lot of the Rob Report uh, right. uh, uh, gatherings of all, their, all the, the advertisers and people that, that, that worked in the Rob Report. Mm -hmm. And we put our booth up and no one would pay any attention to our stuff mm -hmm. because it was kind of, you know, industrial looking, yes. and the Krell stuff was, was industrial and looked right. big and aggressive. Right. And um, none of those people that buy yachts and Ferraris and Rolls Royces that walk by even, even looked at it. Right. So I decided that, you know, I went to one, the last show I went to, they, uh, they had a new watch. I forgot which company it was. But the watches, each watch was $225,000. Oh my goodness. And they sold 25 of them uh -huh. at the show. Yes. And I looked at the watch and it was gorgeous. And I, uh, I said, I'm not, I'm not reaching that marketplace. I'm not, I'm not even scratching that marketplace. Uh -huh. And here I am trying to figure out what I'm, how I'm going to make my product look. Yeah. So I decided to make something beautiful. And it's something I've never done. I've never made the case of a product mm -hmm. and then put the insides in. Right. I always made the insides and then fit a case around it. Right. Mm -hmm. 
So when I started drawing the momentum, I had this idea that I wanted to have something that was smallish, that had a lot of power, right. that, that someone put in their living room. And I finally got to those dimensions that the momentum is, uh -huh. which are actually very classical dimensions. Yeah. The height and the ratio of the width to the length. Golden is ratio? A, yeah, the ratios, yeah, the golden ratio. Yeah. That amplifier is that golden ratio. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, once I had the case, I, I designed the circuit, but I designed a lot of circuits for that amplifier, and I just listened. Mm -hmm. And the ones that sounded best I pulled out and I kept on changing them. So finally I got to a point where I was going between, I had my lab in my house and my audio system in the living room. Uh -huh. So I would wheel it out of my back room, it was a great big office, right. and I'd wheel it into the living room and hook it up and listen to it. And I'm going, wow, that's really good. So I had a couple friends that were audiophiles uh -huh. that lived close by and I had them come over and we, we had them bring their amplifiers so mm -hmm. we could compare them. And I compared them to all the Krell amps. Yeah. And until I got a system that we all could agree on, mm -hmm. that this sounds better than any of these amplifiers, uh -huh. that's when I decided that I had the right thing for the momentum. Okay. And I didn't, I didn't look at distortion. All I looked at was that the circuit was working correctly. Yeah, we would listen, and yeah. we'd, we'd listen late, and we'd bring, they'd bring recordings, yeah. and we'd, we'd have some food, and we'd have some wine, and we'd all drink, right. and we'd listen and hook the system up in play yeah. and I got to a point with the amplifier that I, I, I found the area of the amplifier that I could most make the most significant sonic changes. Yeah. Yeah. So I had these two carts and I would start adjusting uh -huh. and adjusting yeah. and after they left I would make some changes and wheel it back and forth and I finally got to a point where I said wow this is yeah. really quite musical. Yeah. Are they from Phoenix area or? Uh, no, no, this was in of, Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut. Okay. So then I um, uh, decided to buy a distortion analyzer because I didn't have one. Right. So I bought one and I checked to see what the distortion was like. And at Krell standards, it was pretty high. Right. But at other companies, it, it would have been average. Yeah. You know, so I made some adjustments there. And I finally got something that I was kind of happy with electrically and it was stable, mm -hmm. and then I decided to fit it into that size case. Yes. But I quickly learned that I, without putting really big heat sinks on it, uh -huh. I couldn't cool it off. All right. So I decided to try copper, uh -huh. and I always wanted to work with it. And copper is like, it just works so well at absorbing heat. Right. It absorbs heat 91% right. faster than aluminum, mm -hmm. if you can imagine yes. that. And then when you think about copper, it's really heavy. Right. It's super heavy. It's not so, just heavy, but it's also It's dense. It, yeah. It's dense, in, yeah. and it also has a really it's low too. resonance. Yeah. So as a material, it's low resonance uh -huh. and very heavy yeah. and really quick to absorb heat. Uh -huh. The trick with, with this amplifier was how thick the heat sink had to be. Right. Because to make a change on that heat sink, uh, it has to take a long time. A thin piece of copper, a heat change would have been instant. Right. But because it's big, right. it has a thermal mass that dictates mm -hmm. how fast it rises in temperature. Yes. So by making the, the heat sink the width that it is, uh -huh. I was able to make that amplifier work. Okay. So if you play that amplifier, if you play it into unreasonably low speaker loads, and low impedances, mm -hmm. and play it at full power, it'll take more than an hour and a half before it actually gets too hot to touch. Okay, wow. So uh -huh. this condition rarely ever, ever exists. Right. So then um, I did some other things thermally to right. how the transistors cooled. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing that I found out, uh, when I measure uh, output device hooked to an aluminum heat sink, yes. if I measure the heat sink, in the center of the webbing and I measure the output device, uh -huh. they're six to eight degrees C different from each other. Wow. Typical. Because uh -huh. the heat sink's aluminum, it's cooling. Right. It's not it, very efficient. It's not as efficient as copper by any means. Right. But it's also, thermally, it unloads the heat pretty quick. Right. But the output device is always significantly hotter. Mm -hmm. 
when you put the output device on the copper, mm -hmm. when, the out, the, when the amplifier gets the operating temperature, yes. the output device and the copper are the same temperature. Uh -huh. There is no differential. Uh -huh. But because of the thermal uh, mass of the copper is so big right. that the actual whole chassis of the amplifier mm -hmm. becomes the same temperature. Because those two copper heat sinks on a momentum uh -huh. weigh way more than the rest of the amplifier. Right. And they dictate the uh -huh. temperature of the amplifier. How much percentage is it, I mean, uh, mass-wise? Mass-wise, it's, uh, well, it, it, it's probably 70% of the weight. Wow, really? Yeah. Is it, is it a it's, similar? It's probably 60% of the weight. Is it similar with a relentless? Oh, yeah, no. A relentless is just heavy. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the parts, the copper is very heavy on a relentless. Uh -huh. The big, big piece of copper on the Relentless, yeah. each heat sink weighs about 120 pounds. Wow. Each copper piece. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, but on the Relentless, I made a thermal engine. I put a piece of aluminum mm -hmm. and a very uh, uh, sophisticated aluminum heat sink uh -huh. on the outside of the copper. Right. So now the copper, as you know, as we explained, 91% efficient. Wow. Mm -hmm. Instant, instant right. absorption. Uh -huh. Heat sink gets hot. The aluminum heat sink only works when it's hot. Right. So now the copper gets to an operating temperature uh -huh. and has a thermal reluctance of a very long time to change its temperature. Right. So the heat sink now is running all the time oh. and it's passing heat. Okay. So if you put your hand over it, when it's at operating, it's always moving air. Right. So what you have is something that doesn't really change in temperature. Uh -huh. In fact, the heat sink and the, the copper in the heat sink are almost in stasis. The temperature stays almost exactly the same all the time. Right. So uh, when, when you talk about heat sink, you talk about Venturi effect, right? Yes. Yeah. And we, we designed, uh, uh, the, the Momentum has a really traditional Venturi, which is circular, mm -hmm. but I designed a, um, uh, uh, a heat sink with, with it, it's like cutting a Venturi. Mm -hmm opened on mm -hmm. the side okay. and still having a Venturi effect. Can you but explain a Venturi a little bit? Because, okay, yeah. so a Venturi is a small opening yes. turning into a big opening. Uh -huh. So the small opening on the heat sink is on the bottom. Yes. Heat rises, uh -huh. so it's pulling air. Okay. But once it gets past that, the, the Venturi effect is actually sucking air because the volume gets bigger as right. it goes up. Right. Uh -huh. So that's how it works. Okay. It right. works. It works yes. really, really well, actually. So, so cut in half. Well, it's not yeah. cut in half. It's cut open. Uh, cut open. Yeah. Okay. So we get the venturi effect yeah. plus the cooling of the fins right. that are part of the venturi. Okay. So we added some of that, and that, and it's got a nice look. Yeah. And it works very well. Right. Very, very yeah, it well. Looks beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. When you created uh, at the you know, you know, um, you uh, the. Musicality was a really important. Uh, so, yes. uh, so can you, uh, uh, as an audiophile, what does musicality mean to you? Well, what, music, what musicality means to me yep. is something that, that replicates the, li the live event of music mm -hmm. that doesn't irritate you, doesn't sound bright, mm -hmm. doesn't give you listening fatigue. Okay, and that, yeah. that, that's what I wanted. All right. And what I, what I have um, advanced to uh -huh. over the years since I started the company yes. is my pursuit of the information that's on every piece of recorded material mm -hmm. that's in the background. Right. So if you listen to a female vocalist, what is, well, for instance, I, I like this old, uh, some of the Billie Holiday recordings. Yes. <laughs> the musicians that played with Billie Holiday must have been the best musicians of their time. Right. So they're in the background, and you usually don't hear them very well. You hear the, the background, but you don't hear the separate instruments. Right. And you don't hear the tempo of the musicians playing. Yeah. You can hear the tempo, but not that it's as it comes from the instrument. Right. So as you start peeling these layers uh -huh. away, and yeah. you get equipment which much greater resolve mm -hmm. and you maintain the musicality of the circuitry yes you get to see into mm -hmm. recordings and that that's what my that's like my my holy grail right now okay i'm i'm constantly making equipment yeah. 
yes. the, the relentless amplifier peels layers away. Right. Uh, the, uh, the relentless preamp, again, mm-hmm. more layers. The momentum. How do you peel that onion? Well, how do I peel that onion? Okay. By making circuitry that's super sensitive uh-huh. and super quiet. Okay. Uh, My noise floor, noise floor is so far down, yeah. it's almost unmeasured. I mean, we're down on our preamps, 98, almost 100 dB minus. Okay. This wow. is like crazy. Right. Okay, but that mm-hmm. lifts in the, in the relentless because of its um, uh, balanced architecture. Uh-huh. It's a pure right. balanced instrument. Right. It's not bridged, mm-hmm. it's, it's balanced. It's, it's really, really balanced. Difficult to make a balanced circuit, isn't it? Yes. Perfectly ba- balanced but Yeah, because most people take, and they take two amplifiers, right. And they, they reverse the phase mm-hmm. on one of the input boards, mm-hmm. and that becomes your minus, and then they reverse the, f- the other one is in phase, yeah. so you have plus and minus that way, uh-huh. and, it's, and it's balanced. They yeah. call it balanced. It's not balanced right. for two reasons. One, it's not pure balance because those two circuits are not alike. Right. They're, they're as like as two things could be uh-huh. with electronic parts, and how much of a percentage of accuracy can they possibly be? Yeah. But the, but the relentless is a single amplifier. It's a single front end. All right. And it's purely balanced. Mm-hmm. So it never has to account for feedback or anomalies in the input. It is the same input. Yeah. And uh, uh, the interesting thing with the relentless is I can make that as big as I want it to be mm-hmm. right. power-wise. I could make it easily a 6,000-watt amplifier if I yeah. want to. But, you know... It's, it's such an, 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 a, a different approach to making a balanced output. It is a true balanced output. Right. It acts like a cable, so when you put a signal in, it actually does cancel mm-hmm. electrically. Yes. Wow. So it's, a, it's quite a, it, it was, took me a long time to get it to work. Uh-huh. But so when, when did you start to work on that? About four years ago. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And uh, each stage was a challenge. Uh-huh. Each stage was a challenge, yeah. yeah. What is your current system at home right now? I have a pair of Relentless 800s right now. Yeah. Uh, only because they're brand new, and when I get something brand new, I had the 1600s in my house, mm-hmm. but I had to put the 800s in because I had just finished them. Yes. So I, wanna, I usually listen for months uh-huh. before I decide that they're going to be a product. I've been listening to that. I have a pair of Wilson XVXs. Yeah. Um, and uh, they're they're pretty uh, incredible. Uh-huh. I have oh, transparent uh, cable. Mm-hmm. I have a uh, DCS uh, uh, digital stack. Yeah, Vivaldi. With Vivaldi. Yeah. Uh, um, did you get Apex? Yes. Okay. I have all that. I have uh, I have a uh, Air Force three turntable wow. and a clear audio tone arm. Uh-huh. And a Koetsu cartridge on it. Yeah, so, you, you've got the really high end yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I have, uh, I have my phono stage, uh-huh. and that's pretty much my system. Uh, are you using the uh, Momentum phono stage or? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, are you planning to make relentless phono stage uh, Probably. separately? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay. yeah, I have some ideas on that. Yeah. Uh, but that's that's what I'm listening to right now. Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty, pretty crazy. Uh-huh. Pretty impressive. But you know, it's it's like when I went from the the Momentum 400 to the MXV. Yeah. When I designed the uh, the output stage and the the input stage of the 800, I had this idea that I could add that kind of output stage to the MXV, which right. I did, uh-huh. and I made some other changes in it, and it's uh-huh. an extraordinary difference. Uh-huh. It's a really big difference yeah. between an M400 and an MXV. Uh-huh. And it has that difference in listening. It's a space thing. Yeah. There's more space and more space. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously on my quest to peel the onion, right. space is a big deal. Right. I mean, I've, I've, I've got records that I play now and, and, and downloads that I play that actually, you know, my wife, who's not an audiophile, yep. She actually is the CEO of the company right. because she does all the financial things uh-huh. and all the all the things that make the company run. Yeah. I was surprised because you know when I when I saw your company, your wife was 
the CEO. CEO. <laughs> yeah, because I can't. I just am so bad at running yeah. the, the the financial parts yeah. and all the inventory. And yeah. I just don't want to be bothered with it. Yeah. At Krell, you were the chief engineer yeah. as well, right? Yeah. So I was CEO at Krell. Yeah. And I really hated that part. Yeah. It distracted me. Yeah. And I didn't want to be distracted. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're doing really, really good business. We have not so many employees. We have like 23, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, yes. including us. So we're, uh, we're, we're doing what we need to do. Uh -huh. uh, but listening to this MXV after I did that was, right. was really a thrill uh -huh. because that really showed that the momentum could do even better. I mean, think right. about the momentum. The momentum right now, it started out at 300 watts. Now yeah. it's 400 right. watts, close to five when clipping. Right. It doubles into four, it doubles into two, it almost doubles into yeah. one. It's a monster amplifier in a right. very little box. Mm -hmm. It happens to be a product that when you go to an audio show and a woman walks in the audio show, they love it immediately. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> they just love it. And uh, we showed it the first time in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Every morning I got up and cleaned all the fingerprints off the demo amps that were on pedestals, yep. they were all women's fingerprints. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so it was just, it was such a, it's, it's like such jewelry a jewelry in a way. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and that was the idea. Yeah. I wanted to make something that looked like jewelry, uh -huh. felt like jewelry, yes. and, and made beautiful music. Uh -huh. I understand uh, you can also build uh, speaker systems, but at the same time, uh, I understand that you have good relationship with uh, Wilson Audio. So what are the reference loudspeakers uh, when you test the systems? Well, I, 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 I use some Wilsons at the factory. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've listened a lot to uh, all the Wilson products. Uh -huh. I've listened to some magical products which are very instrumental in some of our designs. Yes. So we, we like to do both products okay. really and really uh, but, but in my house, I have some Wilsons right now. Right. Uh, but I like to change things around. It won't, you know, I'm, I'm never, I never know what I'm going to like or want to try. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a matter of manpower to move the stuff. I noticed that uh, only Epic 1600 Mono mentions about the damping factor in the specs. Uh, how important is the damping factor? I think it's pretty unimportant. Uh -huh. yeah. I, mean, I mean, any South State amp is going to have way better damping factor than the speaker. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. I mean, it's going to curl. But all of our amplifiers, the output stage and the, the circuitry in the 800 is really virtually identical to the 1600. Because right. when I made the, eight, the 800, I realized that I had to change the big one uh -huh. because the 800 was better. So uh -huh. when, we, when, we, when, we, when we made the epic upgrade right. for the 1600, uh -huh. that made the, the 800 and the 1600 the same circuitry and the 1600 technically is better yeah. because it's just has just so much power. unlimited power yeah yeah but it, but those amplifiers you've ever get a chance uh -huh. to listen to them and i think that uh that uh, uh ron is bringing some in here yeah. uh, you'll notice that really low levels it's yeah. like silk uh -huh. it never changes yeah and yeah. and and I, I i really after i listened to the 800s I went back to work in the morning and I told everyone, we have to uh -huh. make this upgrade for the 1600. Right. So we did. What did make you decide to build Relentless 800? Well, two things. We, yeah. we, uh, we felt, um, and, and the feedback from the marketplace, I and mean, we sold a lot of 1600s. Right. And, uh, uh, but you know, they're really big. They're really big. Mm -hmm. right. They're almost 700 pounds. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, that's, that's also an issue. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't want to have anything that powerful mm -hmm. on, on their system. Right. A lot of audiophiles have small rooms, right. but, uh, but the 800 is significantly smaller. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about 40% smaller, oh, okay. but it, and it weighs about 350 pounds, mm -hmm. which is still not light. Right. But the big, the big amp is a, is a monster to carry, mm -hmm. but a lot of people just don't want to have anything but that. Mm -hmm. I have guys with four of them, yeah. Six of them. I mean, it's crazy. What kind of speakers do you yeah, have? Yeah, they're bi-amping and tri-amping. Yeah. yeah, it's like, it's like, uh, and those amps, the nice thing about that amp is sonically, it's super smooth and warm right. at lower high levels. You right. never run out of power. Uh -huh. 
Same thing with the 800. You you play stuff with big bands, uh -huh. big orchestration. Yeah. The uh, the dynamics and the musical structure never starts to collapse. Right. You must experience that. Right. You turn the volume up and the sound stage starts to get smaller. Mm -hmm. It should be the other way around. Right. You turn the volume up and the sound stage gets bigger. Exactly. And that's what big amps, really good big amps right. do. And by the way, the damping factor on the 800 was almost identical oh, really? to, the, to the 1600. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, well, that's part of how that circuitry works. Epic is, you know, uh, A class up to around 100 watt, right? Yep. What about 800 then? Pretty close. Wow. How did you manage to do that? Let's let it run a little warmer. Uh -huh. okay. But there's less size uh -huh. and less power. Yeah. And, you know, Ohm's law, there's less voltage. Um, the momentum, uh, you have preamp that's HD. Yeah, the right? HD. Yep. Uh, HD means high definition and right. also high dy dynamic, right? Right, both of those things. Right. So what does high definition mean in audio to you? Well, to me, it means exactly what I have been talking about, right. is how many layers can we peel out, how much information. Mm -hmm. I like to say you own a, a musical format. You own a record, you own a CD, you own a download. Mm -hmm. And why don't you want to hear everything that's on it? Mm -hmm. You really do. You just don't know that. Right because most systems don't have the resolution to hear that. Right. I mean, I, I have to tell a story. I had, I had a system, uh, in this system, I've had people come over my house and I play recordings for them. Mm -hmm. And they listen, they said, wow, I have that. You know, they said, I have that recording at home and I've never heard this, you know, because they, you know, one recording, it's John Coltrane playing. Yeah. And you can hear that the reed has got a lot of saliva on it and it's and it's and it's rasping right. and in it and it's really subtle yeah. and he heard that he said wow there sounds like there's something wrong over here yeah. i said that's on the recording yeah. and uh once he verified that it was really on the recording he mm -hmm. went home and tried to hear it. he said well i hear it on mine but not like yours right. i mean it's that kind of thing right you know and it's the thing that gives you goosebumps uh -huh. it's the thing that makes it you know your hair move on yeah. your back of your neck when uh -huh. something like that happens. Yeah. Or you listen to a, a vocalist in a live recording and you all of a sudden hear the, the echo in the sound stage and, yeah. the, and the, the movement of the musician's feet on the floor yeah. in a classical recording, you sometimes hear that. Right. Yeah, or, or the annoying person that always has to cough way in the background, <laughs> you know, when you're at a concert. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So that, that's the stuff, and not that anyone wants to hear the coughing, but when you hear that kind of stuff that's down, down, down in the really low levels, mm -hmm. it makes for reality. Yeah. So then uh, to, to hear that, you've you got to have the good, well, good speakers. And yes. Also, you, have, you need to have a good source. Uh, source the source component. is important. Yep. Everything in that kind of system is important, but yes. we're really not building any budget products right. and our products should all be able to give you something that you can't buy uh -huh. for 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 uh, unless you spend some money on it yeah because our, I mean it's not really available mm -hmm. in uh, in lower price things but only because the 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 all of the components build up I yes. mean you have to have speakers that can do it yes. even the the cable the interconnect yes. they all have to be at that level before you can start yeah start hearing all that stuff. Right. And I, I mean, I found that out when I, when, I, uh, when I started this company because I really got into listening. And the more, the more I'd, I'd listened to my equipment at a show that a dealer had some stuff that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I'd listen to it and I'd go, wow, I didn't know that that sound was there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I said. I have to have the best stuff that I can get right. in my house all the time. And that's what, I, that's what I do. So that way I can take, uh, 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 I was developing the, mo, mo, the Relentless preamp yeah. when we did the Momentum HD. Mm -hmm. So I, I brought the original Momentum preamp compared to the HD and I said, wow, it's the, the, the Relentless preamp is like well, much better. Right. But you compare a regular Momentum preamp to a, to a Momentum HD, mm -hmm. And the HD is a huge improvement right. and, and similar in sound uh -huh. to the Relentless preamp. But yeah. the Relentless preamp is another level. Right. Just like what the, mo what the Momentum MXV can do, uh -huh. the 800 
does something a little bit different. Right. And I mean, it's it's at, if you're at that level, then you really you really are going to get a thrill. Uh-huh. So by uh, dividing uh, left and right channel, uh, it made a huge difference with uh, pre, uh, relentless preamp, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. But it's the circuitry is much much more advanced. Okay. Wow. So uh, I mean, it, there's only so much that you can put in a box. Exactly. So and I mean, and the and the relentless preamp is full of parts. All right. It All doesn't right. have a lot of spare air, area. All right. Yeah, and but also by taking the all of the power supply components and all the processing uh-huh. and putting it in that center box, uh-huh. uh, that takes all of the noise. And I mean, believe me, digital processors and and signal conditioning for for DACs and all they all they all make noise. Yeah, and it and it affects like audio. That. Right. But if you have the audio isolated in uh-huh. its own box, so the top box and the bottom box right. are just totally isolated. They don't have anything but audio in it. Mm-hmm. And it makes a nice difference in sound and noise floor. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I noticed, you know, the, basically, momentum MXV is momentum momentum, which is like momentum squared. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's so, yeah, right. That, that's, like, that's like saying that, that we finally got the momentum to be... Yeah. Uh, in in the momentum formula, right. MXV yeah. is mass is times, mass times velocity, velocity yeah. equals momentum. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you use uh, um, front end based on F, uh, FET. We have FETs in the front end. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, why? How did you decide to do that? Well, I'm always looking for uh, for uh, uh, devices. Right. And finally. Um, I found some matching uh, FET devices that are available, mm-hmm. and they're in little military packages right. that are really, uh, uh, really wonderful products. Mm-hmm. Back in the uh, 80s, we could buy FETs, right. but those companies didn't make FETs anymore. Right. So I changed to bipolar, uh-huh. and now I have changed uh, to FETs uh-huh. in the input. Wow. Yeah, but, th- but it, I don't use them in a traditional manner. Uh-huh. So, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't just say it's a FET front end. Right. It's a FET enhanced front end. You don't usually use a capacitor in the uh, signal path. Yeah, signal Never. path. Right. Yeah. So uh, relentless also uh, doesn't use pure DC. Yeah. Pure DC. Okay. What is your crowning achievement so far? It's really hard to um, to give you a, a crowning achievement. I I think right now that I am. Uh, I'm really thrilled with the results we got with the with the relentless amplifiers and the relentless preamp. Right. And uh, of course, my baby, which is the momentum, right, is so good right now that I I have a hard time believing it's that good. Uh-huh. And we I bring it, I go to dealer shows and they put it on, and it's just extraordinary. Right. And you can you can see that because so many companies that that use the MXV for, and they use the momentum, but when there's X MXV updates, they bought it, and then they actually bought them for their home system, right. and they have them in their business, both, because uh-huh. it's such a revelation, right. and it's, it's such a pleasant amplifier to listen to. Uh-huh. And it's one of the heaviest amplifiers. Oh, yeah, it's size. really heavy. It's, a, <laughs> it's 120 pounds. Right. But people don't realize when they send... They can send their original uh-huh. Momentum 300 in, right. and they can get it updated, okay. and it'll be exactly the same sound and components uh-huh. as a new MXV. Right. Uh, and the only thing that they keep yeah. is their case. Uh-huh. We take everything out and throw it away, okay. literally. Wow. When, when, when we start an update, the first thing we do uh-huh. is take all the boards out, uh-huh. throw them away. We throw the transformer away. Yeah. We throw everything away. The only thing you have left... Uh-huh is the case. So uh, for Momentum, you, you ship it to Arizona, uh, Phoenix, yeah. to uh, get it uh, get it serviced. Yeah, but like a, a, a distributor like Groico could do the update. Mm. So if people want the update, we can send them the material and they okay. could do it. A relentless is the same thing. Right? Well, we don't, the, the Relentless 1600s, we actually fly. Yeah. We fly. They, the, when, yeah. There's only, actually there's only one pair of relentless that haven't been updated and we haven't got there yet. I'm trying to think of where, yeah. but it's somewhere but, in the in the Far East. Oh yeah, okay. 
Okay. So, and that's the only pair, and they're just waiting for us to get there. How did uh, COVID-19 affect you? God, it made us uh, crazy. We, we, uh, we, we had so many sales, and we just, we just started catching up <laughs> recently. Yeah, so it's a good news. For it, it was great for us, yeah. and, and our governor in Arizona didn't stop any businesses from running. Yeah. Nothing closed. Yeah. Nothing closed. Yeah. It was just, it was wonderful uh -huh. that we could work. Uh-huh. But I mean, I mean, if you, if you, if I mean, if you were in one of those states where the state just closes you down, right? You know, I know I have friends in in states where they have businesses, and the 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 government just told them, you know, at five o'clock tonight, you're closed. Yeah. So we 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 did really well during COVID. Uh, after COVID, how uh, how is it? It's good. It's yeah. it's certainly a little bit slower. Yeah. But uh, you know we're we're still in a back order situation and we're uh -huh. still building. Okay. Yeah, and we have we have, you know we have new projects coming for next year. We have some other products coming out. You source uh, pretty much everything from Arizona area, right? Yeah. Phoenix area. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some of our metal comes from Colorado. We have that, and we have some local machine shops, in um, in Arizona that do some of the products. Mm -hmm. But you're located in. North, we're we're right? in Cave Creek, yeah. at the ex, the extreme north of Scottsdale. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a little cowboy town. Uh -huh. They yeah. call themselves the last cowboy town in America. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have horses that ride on the street, and uh -huh. we have a couple cowboy bars there that uh -huh. offer amateur bull riding. If you ever want to go there, and have you tried it? No. <laughs> <laughs> You're the founder and the visionary of your company and the name of your company is from your name. And uh, how do you train the next generation so that they can carry on your legacy? Well, I have uh, children working for me, yeah. uh, son and daughter. Uh -huh. And I have, uh, I have uh, my engineers that I'm training. Uh -huh. And uh, when you work for me, yeah. you have to be ready to uh, drop what you're doing and change up to try something new. And um, there's some frustration, but they get it. Yeah. And uh, my head engineer there, Burhan, uh -huh. uh, he uh, is getting very good. Uh -huh. He's getting very good. Yeah. So uh, it's hard to get somebody to think like you. Uh, uh, and I'm sure that that runs through all industries. Mm -hmm. The founders have a certain way of thinking about right. things and the people that work for him. But, but I think that... Uh, uh, we've been working together for over about five years, okay. and he's very, very good right now, and I, wow. I can trust him well, you, to do you, the right things. You have such a long, uh, long-term experience with audio, so yeah. it's, it's going to be really difficult to find. You know. Somebody. Well, I don't think that that it's really necessary for him to have my Renaissance knowledge mm -hmm. from okay. all the stuff that I've done. Oh. But it, but I mean, you know, as long as I'm around, even if I want to retire. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I'm not planning on doing right now, but right. I will someday. Yeah. And by that time, I'm, I know that he'll know uh -huh. what, I mean, I, there's only so many things that are important for him to have Renaissance knowledge of uh -huh. from what we're doing. I've narrowed down our spectrum uh -huh. of how we operate and what kind of products we build. Uh -huh. And we're going to continue along those lines. Uh -huh. And the new products we're working on uh, reflect a different kind of thinking within our, our envelope. Are you willing to retire? I mean, it's your oh, hobby for you. I'm never going to be ready to retire. And I love what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and uh, I've always liked going. I've never, never really considered it work. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I worked, when I, when I started this company, I, I realized, I mean, I had 11 engineers at Krell. Mm -hmm. So I could go to each one and assign them work, mm -hmm. check on it over a period of time, yes. make sure it went the direction. So my, my engineering that I actually did myself uh -huh. was limited. Yes. So I, I would point them in directions. They'd draw stuff up. I'd look at it and say, no, let's do this. Let's do that. Uh -huh. Then they'd do it. Yeah. But this, I just had to start doing myself, and I forgot how much fun that was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. The, the momentum was fun to develop. Uh -huh. It was kind of um, scary because yeah. we had four kids in college. Right. And... Uh, it was really hard to get started, yeah. but I, I work, I love working, so I mean, I would work. I, ha, I, I did it all in my house, it all started there. And I, I would get up in the morning early, mm -hmm. six, 
six thirty right. and work till seven, eight o'clock at night every yeah. day. At that time, you know, uh, Dave Wilson helped you also, right? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I my friends, Sumner. yeah, my friends that were in the business. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Dave lent me speakers. Karen sent me cables. Yeah. DCS sent me a DAC. Right. I mean, all those guys helped. Uh -huh. yeah. So it was really, really nice. Mm -hmm. So when Dave died, you know, how did you feel? I felt uh, like I'd lost an old friend. Uh -huh. Really not good. Yeah. Um, I told Dave, Dave had a pair of momentums Momentum, that he loved. Right. And he said, you know, sometimes I wish I just had a little more power. And he had a pair of Momentum 300s, and I upgraded in 400s, uh -huh. and that was a lot better. He liked them. Uh -huh. uh, he hadn't gotten to the MXV stage yet, right. but I told him I was working on this big amplifier. Uh -huh. And uh, he said, wow, I would love to hear what that's going to be like. Yeah. So, um, and Dave knows when I make a big amplifier, it's really right. a big amplifier. Right. And uh, so when I found out his... Uh, uh, health was on the way down. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I brought the Relentless home when mm -hmm. we first got him working, mm -hmm. and I just got him on test equipment. I didn't have anything big enough yeah. to listen to them at the factory. Uh -huh. I wasn't in the factory. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I mean, now I was in a small, small factory in right. Arizona, so I got them home, and I brought them home, and I turned them on because the thing I was really worried about was that they wouldn't be better than the momentum, sonically. Okay. So I put them on, yeah. and immediately they were better than the momentum. And, yeah. and then I started listening, and they, and they just, it was just like incredible. So I called my friend in California, uh -huh. uh, Meyer Shadi, yeah. who has a store there. Uh -huh. He came, he drove over, yeah. and uh, he got there Saturday morning. We listened all weekend. Yeah. And then uh, my wife, Petra, told me, he said, you know, you really have to get these amplifiers to Dave, to Dave Wilson so yeah. he can hear them. Yeah. So uh, I told Meyer, you want to go for a ride? He <laughs> said, yeah. So we went and rented a truck, yeah. and we put them on there. I was afraid of shipping them because right. there was only one pair in existence. Right. And when you ship something big and heavy like that, mm -hmm. it's possible they'll split the shipment up. Right. You know, one will get there, and the next day or the day after, the other one. So I decided I can't take that chance. So I drove them up there, and Dave Wilson's guys and, uh, and I came out, and we, we got them out of the truck, but we couldn't get them upstairs. But Meyer brought his, he has an Italian robot oh. that's controlled with an umbilical cord. Oh, really? Yeah, so we put the amplifiers on the robot uh -huh. and strapped them on, uh -huh. and it walked up the steps for us wow. and got it to the front door. Uh -huh. And then we took them out of the box and put them on a dolly, yeah. And rolled them to where they had to go, uh -huh. but it was it would have been really hard to get them up Dave's steps. They were not friendly, but yeah. the robot didn't mind. Yeah, sure. I'm sure we would have got him there, but I yeah. we had some slivers and and yeah. some, some strained backs and yeah, muscles. Exactly. And yeah. 700 pounds is not a gentle thing to move. Right. And Dave could only list uh, be around and up out of his bed about an hour a day. Oh, okay. So he came down. And he listened, and he got tears in his eyes. He loved it. I did, too. And yeah. uh, we listened. We had a wonderful hour listening. He actually listened longer, and then he had to go upstairs. Uh -huh. So we left him there overnight, and then we went back in the morning yeah. and picked him up because I had to get him back. Right. So I brought him back. And I think Dave passed on about two weeks after that. Right. And then I went to the funeral. What kind of music did you listen to at the time? All of Dave's recordings. Oh, uh, okay. Very which nice. were really yeah. great. Yeah, exactly. That was a lot I of fun. I love them. In his room, it was really nice. You know, Dave and I, um, back in 83, yes. uh, we showed together with the Wham at the uh, uh -huh. Belmont Hotel in Chicago. Yeah. We've kind of been the, friends ever since. Yeah. You used that relentless on Wham. Well, there, right? The original uh, Wham, we used the, the yeah. Krell products. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I mean, I mean. Oh, yeah, we used yeah. the Relentless on the Wham there. Yeah, so. Which so was a riot. Like, yeah. oh, that was so much fun. So at the beginning, you used Wham at Krell, and with Krell. Yep. Yeah. And at the when end. When the Relentless used, was done, we yeah. used the Wham again. Yeah. Well, different, a different, different generation. I wanted a pair of Whams for my living room. Dave wanted me to have them. Uh -huh. 
but I can't fit, I couldn't fit them because I live in a little desert house. Uh-huh. It's only 2,000 square feet. Yeah. It's got three rooms uh-huh. and uh, my ceiling's too low. Yeah. Well, but XVX is nice. Yeah. XVX is really good. Yeah. If one goes for the WAM and uh, subsonic, would he need? Well, I mean, I, I have a lot of customers with yeah. WAMs, yeah. a lot of customers, yeah. and all of them probably have two pairs of Relentless amps. Relentless, right. Yeah. All Epic one? Yeah, they're all Epics. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you have new stuffs coming out next year. Next year, yeah. March or April. Yeah. And yeah, so, so the uh, Munich one? Yeah. They'll be there for Munich. Yeah. You know, I understand you, you, you are planning to uh, build a headphone amplifier. Yeah, that's a, it's been like four years or something that I've been working on a headphone amplifier. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like headphones are really, really interpersonal, uh-huh. private. Yeah. And I keep on changing the circuitry and changing it. It's probably had 12 changes mm-hmm. since I started it. And I wanted to make it so that it was really, really perfect for headphones. Uh-huh. And every time I start thinking and start thinking and I outthink myself, and then I throw it away and I do another one. So it's been sitting there and, I, and I'm not sure I'm going to do a headphone amp oh, really? now because it's been so long. Yeah. But I first wanted to make it because everybody with headphones kind of misses, misses the fact that a headphone amp should have eight, not eight, but probably 10 to 15 watts, right. not three or two or four. Right. Needs real power and should uh-huh. be able to drive a small pair of speakers. Yeah. And secondly, when you're listening to headphones, I think everything in the box uh-huh. should be 100% analog. Uh-huh. I don't think there should be any, any processors. Right switching devices, uh-huh. any kind of uh, uh, ladder style volume controls. Yeah. So I need a regular volume control that's uh-huh. manual. So I've sourced all those parts. Uh-huh. But I mean, it keeps, on, it keeps on morphing, it keeps on changing. Yeah. And I finally have one that I can build now, uh-huh. but I have these other products that I'm doing right. that are much more attuned to what the world's looking for right now. With Relentless and yeah. so on, yeah. yeah. Uh, but these, these new products are going to be very exciting in a slightly different way. Oh, really? And, and, and they have very new circuit, uh-huh. circuitry. Yeah. So it's going to trickle forward and down? Well, and it's, go, it's going, I'm, I, I have to say, some of this, these products are a little bit lower in price, mm-hmm. oh, but, okay. but their, their technology is very advanced. Uh-huh. It's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about it. And likewise, you know, I look forward yeah. to seeing them. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>